Welcome to the WebMD Health Discovered podcast. I'm Dr. Neha Batuk, WebMD's Chief Physician Editor for Health and Lifestyle Medicine. Today, we're taking a deep dive into weight loss and weight management. But our focus extends beyond the scale. We want to explore strategies that address not just weight, but well-being, mental, and physical health. We're also going to talk about how the evolving landscape of weight loss drugs fits in. In navigating this topic, we're focusing on the six key pillars of lifestyle medicine and how they tie together with weight management. Lifestyle medicine is a medical specialty that uses therapeutic lifestyle interventions as a primary mode to treat chronic conditions. So when it comes to weight loss and weight management, This could include things like a whole food, plant-rich diet, sustainable physical activity, embracing restorative sleep for your body, managing stress, and thinking about your social connections, and also minimizing substance use. Today, we're going to talk through those pillars. Here to guide us through this topic is Dr. Mahima Gulati. Dr. Gulati is a triple board-certified physician specializing in endocrinology, diabetes, metabolism, lifestyle medicine, as well as internal medicine. She's an associate professor of medical sciences at the Frank H. Netter School of Medicine, Quinnipiac University, where she teaches both endocrinology and lifestyle medicine to medical students. Welcome to the WebMD Health Discovered podcast, Dr. Galati. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor. Well, I'm so, so excited to jump into our discussion. But before we do, I'd just love to ask about your own personal health discovery. So what was your aha moment around practicing lifestyle medicine, specifically around weight loss and weight management? As a practicing endocrinologist, I felt very ineffective to give you an idea of when a person sees an endocrinologist in our country. Typically, we get to see patients who are towards the complicated end of their disease spectrum. So if somebody gets diagnosed with type 2 diabetes or hypothyroidism, they don't typically end up seeing an endocrinologist or a specialist unless if they really genuinely request for it or insist on it. They are usually managed in their primary care setting, and they are usually referred to us when their diabetes or thyroid disease becomes quite complicated. They don't have adequate control of their symptoms or disease. And so we saw the most complicated patients. I don't think I was bringing my best treatment or my best cure to someone's ailment. And that was bearing down on me. That was weighing me down. And it was then that I went by chance to a Harvard conference, which was not on lifestyle medicine, but I heard the words lifestyle medicine mentioned there for the first time by Dr. Beth Freites, who's the current president of American College of Lifestyle Medicine. And When I heard those two words, lifestyle medicine, I was completely baffled. I had never heard that term. There was this entire field of knowledge that I was not aware of. So that was my aha moment of discovering lifestyle medicine. I was determined to read it, to get certified in it, which I did in 2018. And then over the years, I have been able to understand it in the context of obesity. That was the turning point, the pivotal moment in my life when I realized how much I didn't know or was ignorant of. Thank you so much for sharing that. So today we're going to specifically focus on the weight loss piece and the weight management piece of it. What do we mean when we say lifestyle medicine? So lifestyle medicine is actually almost 20 years old. It's a medical specialty that studies the science of our health behaviors. These are six brackets or six pillars that affect our risk for common illnesses or our health, essentially. And these six pillars are our nutrition, whether we are eating wholesome, nourishing whole foods, mostly plants. The second pillar is our movement or physical activity if we are moving through the day. The third pillar is our rest or sleep, how restorative that is, the quality and the quantity of our sleep. The fourth pillar is our ability to manage or deal with stress, our response to stress. The fifth pillar is avoiding or reducing risky addictive substances like tobacco or recreational drugs or minimizing alcohol intake. 
And the last sixth pillar, but my favorite pillar is social connections or our relationships uh, and how positively we connect with other creatures around us, including uh, humans, but also animals, etc. I love it if you could also just set the stage when it comes to the landscape of weight loss medications that we're hearing about in the media right now. What do those sort of medicines entail? How do they work? And what should we sort of know about them as a strategy being used more recently? In the interest of time, I will limit our discussion today to the, the most popular and the most effective class of drugs, which are the incretin mimetic drugs or the, the popularly known as the GLP-1, the GLP-1 receptor agonist drugs. There is certain number of gut peptides. These are hormones that are produced by enteroendocrine cells that are situated in our intestines, the small and the large intestines. So they produce these tiny peptides, which were called incretin, which means insulin secreting. And these incretins are produced in response to the glucose load. But not just glucose, even amino acids or other nutritional substrates that we ingest would promote the production of gut peptides like incretins, like GLP-1. And these peptides would go back to the pancreatic beta cell and promote the production of insulin. And that's how the discovery came about. So there was a lot of interest in using these gut peptides as anti-diabetic medication because they were promoting the production of insulin and thereby decreasing the blood glucose levels. Over the last few decades, we realized that not only were they decreasing blood glucose, but they were also slowing down the stomach's emptying of the food. Also, they were actually having an effect on the brain receptor. So the brain actually has GLP-1 receptors, and it was decreasing appetite or satiety signaling. That happened more with the more potent GLP-1, so the ones that can be injected once a week. They have a long duration of action, and they are more potent. And they were really suppressing people's appetite to the point where people were now eating two-thirds of what they used to eat before, or even half of what they were eating before. And it was kind of serendipitous or accidental that we discovered the weight loss promoting effects of these incretins. And now they have been FDA approved for anti-obesity pharmacotherapy. Okay, that is supremely helpful information. So I would love to then kind of have you walk us through step by step when you're thinking about your arsenal of being able to treat folks that have concerns about their weight. And we know that in the U.S. right now, 40 percent of adults can be classified as obese. Another 30 percent can be classified as overweight. And then there are those of us that maybe potentially are not in that category, but still sort of concerned about our weight management. How do you think about your arsenal? Where do you start? What's your step-by-step -step approach to sort of think through using these various tools that you have? I am what I call a lifestyle endocrinologist. So anybody who sees me, we talk about lifestyle. I don't even talk about their weight unless it, they talk about their weight. So patients don't come to me just for weight loss, although many patients do come for that. But patients come to me because they have had uh, hypothyroidism for a long time and they have joint pains and they are suffering from brain fog or fatigue. Or if they've had type 2 diabetes, they really want better control of their sugars and so on. So for me, the approach is almost universal. Everybody gets to talk about their lifestyle, their sleep, their vegetable intake, their fiber intake, their physical activity, because all of us need lifestyle medicine approaches. In terms of starting with that approach, what is the science with regards to weight loss or weight management benefit? So let's talk about some of the very ignored or understated pillars of lifestyle medicine. For example, relationships and the impact of loneliness or isolation or the impact of having support from whether it's your spouse or if it's your friend circle, etc. If you look at the largest diabetes remission trial, one of the largest and the most famous ones, which is direct trial from the UK, the diabetes remission clinical trial from the UK, it was a game changer in the field of remission of type 2 diabetes. And what they found in that trial was the biggest predictor of somebody's success in remitting their type 2 diabetes and maintaining that remission over time was the support of their spouse. And that has been studied through many multiple weight loss registries as well. Weight loss is easier. People can lose weight. Maintaining weight loss is where the crux is. And that's harder. 
And it turns out through all of these weight loss registries that people who keep the weight off are the ones who have a good amount of support from their family and friends. In fact, in direct trial, the, the successful diabetes remitters, their spouses also lost substantial amounts of weight. And just to tell you as a physician who practices these patients with diabetes day in and day out, the number of times I get told by my women patients, oh, my husband's never going to eat that if I make that. So having the backing of our community, whether that's our friends, whether that's our family, whether that's our church, whether that's our colleagues at workplace, it turns out there's a huge amount of uh, literature on that. In fact, the U.S. Surgeon General just published a scientific advisory on our pandemic of loneliness in May 2023. So that's one big evidence piece. And when somebody wants to make a weight loss plan, the number one thing that we need to write down on, it's not, oh, which diet am I going to go on? Am I going to eliminate carbs? Am I going to limit carbs? It is going to list down at least three or four different pillars of support. And that is something we need to enlist. That this is who I'm accountable to. This is who I am doing this for and who will help me, who will be my pillar of support. Because having that is critical to ongoing success or maintenance of success. Then the second pillar, which I think the U.S. is suffering massively, is sleep deprivation, our lack of sleep pandemic, especially young adults and children and teenagers. So there was a very fascinating study in JAMA Internal Medicine in 2022, which took 80, 80 young overweight adults. I think their average age was less than 30, 29.8 years. And they were sleep deprived adults. They were sleeping on an average 6.5 hours or less which kind of mirrors uh, American sleep duration. An average American adult, yeah, an average American adult in the 1960s would sleep at least eight hours at night. And in 2018, pre-pandemic, an average American adult slept 6.7 hours at night. So we, as a collective, on an average, we lost 1.3 hours of nightly sleep. So this 80 young adult cohort, they what they did is they provided each one of them with individualized sleep hygiene counseling through sleep counselors. And they made sure that for the next two weeks, they were sleeping an extra 1.2 hours. So most of this came from cutting out screens at night or blue light at night. But, you know, they were able to achieve extra 1.2 hours of sleep every night for these adults over two weeks. And amazingly, or not amazingly, this I guess this should have been uh, something I would have expected the uh, adults, they ate on an average 270 calories less each day. And they lost one pound at the end of those two weeks, which doesn't sound that impressive. But if you look at eating 270 calories less each day over a three-year period, that amounts to a weight loss of 12 kilograms on an average by doing nothing, by doing nothing, just by sleeping an extra 1.2 hours at night. So that is the data. This was a JAMA internal medicine randomized control trial. And then we could talk all day long about stress management and the impact of cortisol. So there is a disease in endocrinology called Cushing syndrome, which me and my colleagues, we dread because it can really sicken people. The amount of metabolic dysfunction that can be wrought by excess cortisol, whether that's high blood pressure, whether that's impaired glucose tolerance, whether that's central adiposity, whether that's increase in triglycerides, cognitive effects, neuropsychiatric effects. It's so having high cortisol is detrimental. And having chronically elevated low-grade increase in cortisol or increase in our sympathetic nervous system drive can impact our baseline heart rate, our baseline blood pressure, our ability to sleep at night. And this is, again, another pandemic in modern-day world. I would not just say modern-day America, but modern-day world. And we are not systematically practicing stress management techniques. Now, if you go back maybe a century, maybe our ancestors spent time during their day systematically practicing these techniques, whether that was breath work, whether that was guided imagery, whether that was some kind of transcendental music, meditation, or whatever. They had time dedicated in their day to spend on these techniques. And we don't. Most of us don't, unless if we try to. So that is another 
big pandemic facing us that we are not teaching our children, we are not teaching ourselves, and we're not creating that structured time and training where we can actually train our body for stress response. I love that you started with some of the pillars that you don't traditionally think about as part of your lifestyle arsenal when it comes to weight management. Because I think most of us think, well, okay, what does this mean? What's your prescription for my nutrition pillar? And then what's your prescription for my physical activity pillar? And I think that you've just provided so much important information about some of these other interconnected pillars because what you eat and how much you move are very much dependent on those other pillars. So I think that's key. And I want to kind of pick out an interesting point that you made earlier, which is that if you had a penny for every time your patient said, well, my support system is not going to do that. What's your success with talking about lifestyle first or as an adjunct with some of these other therapeutics? So it has to be really tailored to the individual and their environment. There is no one size fits all. I think all of us in lifestyle medicine know that. It, it really would depend on the priorities of the patient and what is the needle they can move. As a lifestyle medicine practitioner, we are the coach. We're not the player of the game. And my job is to really help the person, the patient, come to a plan or come to a uh, strategy that would work for them long term. Now, if their goal is short term, if they are looking at something that need, they need to accomplish in the next three months, then that's different. But most of the times they've gone through a lot of different diets or fads and they come to us and they want to do something that they can sustain for life. And really, patients know they are the experts. I'm not the expert. I'm not the specialist in their life. They are. And they know what would work in their environment. And my goal is to help the patient come to that answer, not to answer that for them. So that's been my approach, to really listen deeply and to listen with my whole body. It can't happen if I am listening and typing at the same time. And it takes time. It takes a relationship to develop over maybe multiple visits. Sometimes it can happen in the context of a shared medical appointment where, where there are other co-sufferers, where there are people who've had the same dynamic. I think that that really shows why it also helps a physician's well-being when you're practicing medicine this way, because you get to really listen to your patient and not just put a Band-Aid on, like you mentioned. So if we think about the long-term side effects of lifestyle medicine, mm -hmm. the long-term side effects are you get to improve your blood pressure, you get to improve your sugar control. You get to improve your mental health along with potential weight loss um, and weight management that you might achieve that might be more sustainable. What about some of the potential side effects with some of the medicines that we were talking about earlier? Yeah, so these drugs are a very useful tool in the toolkit. So when we were talking about that first aid box and band-aids, so definitely these drugs are a step up on, let's say, insulin therapy for type 2 diabetes. They are associated with better outcomes, but they're not for everybody. There are people who may not respond favorably with these drugs. They may have very severe side effects. These are less common, but they can happen. The common ones are, as you may have heard, nausea or constipation. Constipation is very common, abdominal discomfort, and that happens to most people. And that's why we start low and then we escalate doses gradually over a period of at least a month because these are weekly drugs to the highest tolerated dose that they can go. And some patients can only go to a medium dose or maybe a low dose. The less common ones, which can be more sinister side effects, can be things like acute pancreatitis, which has been reported due to gallstones or other things. So we should routinely counsel our patients not to go overboard with alcohol. I always tell them alcohol and these drugs don't mix very well. Then there could be gallstones or cholelithiasis, biliary colic. The more Dangerous ones would be intestinal obstruction. The FDA actually put in a, another warning for ileus. I think that was in fall of 2023. That was reported, again, super uncommon, but can happen. And then there can be things like acute kidney injury. If somebody is very dehydrated and is vomiting and they already have baseline diabetes and chronic kidney disease, they can go into acute kidney failure. This has been just so much amazing and really helpful information. So I do want to just turn it to you. I would love it if you can close the episode with a bite-sized action item or what you hope would be the key takeaways for people that are listening today. For all of us who are patients, I think focus on what pillar matters the most to you. 
if you all are not able to sleep even more than five hours at night because of so many overcommitments and demands on your schedule, how can you get that extra one hour of sleep? And something very tiny, something that would not take a lot of resistance overcoming, something that would be basic and you can build into your life today, whether that's a two-minute jumping jacks practice or taking a 10-minute walk after dinner, something that you can do on your hardest, most overscheduled day. And I think every one of us can get to that when we sit down and spend two to five intentional minutes and jot that down. And I, I just cannot overemphasize how transforming that tiny little step can be. It might sound simplistic. It might be like two minutes. That cannot transform my life, but it truly can because that first step is what leads to the transformation. So I think that would be my take-home message and also connect with others. One of the best things that I learned from lifestyle medicine was this aphorism, which was illness begins with I and wellness begins with we. And so also think about who you connect with and what you connect with and make that an important priority in one's life. Wow. I just want to thank you so much for being with us today. This has been really a transformative conversation for me. So I thank you so much, Dr. Galati. Thank you so much, Dr. Patak. This was an honor. We've talked with Dr. Mahima Gulati about, I think, so many important things, but the key takeaways for me in terms of a step-by-step -step approach to weight loss or weight management is really thinking about those two to five minutes for you that are going to be your gateway to better sleep, your gateway to more physical activity, your gateway to improved nutrition, and then talking to your health professional about how some of these other medications fit in in your personal situation, absolutely a tool in the toolkit, but just regardless of whether or not that tool is appropriate for you, just in this discussion with Dr. Golati, learning how much lifestyle, no matter what is going on, even if you are fully well at this point in time, how important that piece is to keep you well. To find out more information about Dr. Galati, we'll link her information in our show notes. Thank you so much for listening. Please take a moment to follow, rate, and review this podcast on your favorite listening platform. If you'd like to send me an email about topics you're interested in or questions for future guests, please send me a note at webmdpodcast at webmd.net. This is Dr. Neha Bhattuk for the WebMD Health Discovered Podcast. Podcast.